It's my real pleasure to, to welcome today our speaker, Professor Robin Graham from Seattle. Uh, since Professor Graham is coming from far away, let me briefly sketch his, his professional path. So he did his undergraduate study in Houston at Rice University. And Houston is a typical place for geometers in, in the southern part of the US. So you should, you should know this. And he did his graduate studies in Princeton. And then as a postdoc, he was in Kuran Institute in NYU and again in Princeton. And finally, after this, he said, Professor Graham settled down at Seattle and he is there until now. The subject of the talk today is gauss bonnet formula for a renormalized area of minimal submanifolds of Poincaré Einstein basis. Robin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jersey. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Warsaw. Um, I would like to thank Pavel for the invitation to come to Warsaw and Jersey for the welcome to the, the physics department. So there are many words in my title. Uh, so I thought maybe I would uh, start by just explaining some of these words, starting with the Poincaré-Einstein metrics. Um, so suppose that we have a compact manifold with boundary of dimension n plus one, um, and I'll always denote the boundary by m. Um, and then we can choose a defining function for the boundary. So this is a function that's positive on the inside and vanishes to first order at the boundary. Um, and then we have a metric uh, on the interior. Uh, and we'll say that it's conf oops, conformally compact uh, if when you multiply it by the square of the defining function that extends smoothly to the boundary. Um, so R squared times G plus is called a compactification of G plus because this is a, a smooth metric. And of course, the metric G plus itself uh, is singular. It blows up at the boundary. Um, so uh, we look at the metric G. G is always going to be the metric uh, on the boundary that you get by restricting to the boundary, um, the induced metric. Um, and then, of course, G depends on the choice of defining function. If you change the defining function, G changes, but only up to scale. The conformal class of G on the boundary is independent of which defining function you choose. And so that's the conformal infinity uh, of, this, of this metric. So we say that this metric is, this, this G plus is Poincaré-Einstein if it's conformally compact in this sense and it satisfies the Einstein equation. Uh, Ricci curvature is minus N times G plus. So the, is, no, there's no matter. It's just, it's just vacuum, yeah, vacuum situation. That's right. So the, the motivating, it's just pure geometry I'll be talking about here really. So, so N is a positive number. Yes, it's usually going to be two or more, at least two. It's an integer. Yeah, it's an integer. Yeah, yes, it's the dimension. It's the dimension of this space X. Yeah. Um, yeah, and X has dimension N plus one. Yeah. So the motivation, motivating example is hyperbolic space, uh, where the, the, the metric, uh, the Poincaré metric on the ball is, has this form. So this is clearly uh, satisfies these conditions. Okay, so that's Poincaré-Einstein metric. So the next thing in my title was uh, minimal submanifolds. So we're interested in submanifolds of, of, of one of these Poincaré-Einstein spaces um, of, of arbitrary dimension here. So the, actually the dimension will be at least two, uh, but I'll call the dimension K plus one. Um, and I always want to look at, let's see, at, at, oh, so the, the, the condition defining a minimal submanifold is that the mean curvature is zero. So you take the second fundamental form, that's the extrinsic curvature, you take the trace, that has to be zero. And that's a vector in the high, in the co-dimension greater than one case, the mean curvature is a vector. So this is a system of equations. So we're gonna only look at minimal submanifolds that go all the way out to the boundary. Um, so we, we assume that uh, the intersection with the boundary is an embedded submanifold of the boundary of dimension K. This is a interesting topic in geometry. So uh, for example, there's a plateau problem. Uh, if you're given the, the, the intersection with infinity, then you would like to find a minimal submanifold. 
Um, this is a, a, a classical problem. It's been studied a lot, uh, especially on hyperbolic space. And for example, uh, the Michael Anderson proved in the 1980s that, that there's always a solution. This plateau problem always have a, has a solution. Um, although the, the, uh, the, the, the minimal submanifold may have singularities uh, on the interior. It may be, may be a current. I'm going to just look at the case where, where it's smooth, but uh, in general, you may have singularities. And these, these uh, minimal submanifolds also arise in the ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, the intersection with the boundary and the conformal field theory on the boundary uh, is uh, related to various different submanifold observables, Wilson loops, and so forth in the boundary. And they're usually often studied by looking at these minimal submanifolds that, that they, that, that, um, that they that extend them. I'm always working here, and it'll be in Riemannian signature, Euclidean signature. Yeah, positive definite. Okay, and and the the the, the submanifolds we're going to consider are always going to be regular at infinity. So you have some smooth or asymptotic expansion for the submanifold at infinity. Okay, so that was the second topic. Uh, the third thing in the title was renormalized area. So. Um, of course, the, the basic geometric invariant of any uh, geometric space is its volume or its area. Um, but any one of these minimal submanifolds has infinite area. It's easy to see because the, the induced metric blows up. Um, but there's a renormalization procedure that you can associate a finite number, which is some substitute for the area. Um, so suppose we have a Poincare Einstein metric, and suppose we fix a uh, representative of the conformal infinity. So that's a choice that we make. Um, then that uniquely determines a defining function in a neighborhood of the boundary uh, as follows. Um, so uh, you first actually require that, 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 that when you compactify with that defining function, you get the, the metric that you chose. Um, and then you impose a, a, a differential equation uh, which is an iconal equation. It says that the, the length of the, the gradient of this defining function with respect to the compactified metric is one, stays constant. Um, and this equation has a unique solution for R it's, and, and it's called the geodesic defining function because the, the flow lines of the gradient of R with respect to the compactified metric are geodesics for the compactified metric. So, um, now let, let H plus be the induced metric on the minimal submanifold. Um, then uh, the, th that metric, yeah, that metric is also conformally compact. It's easy to see um, as a metric just on the space Y. Um, so the area of Y is infinite, but what we're going to do is look at a, an expansion of the area when we, when we move in by a small amount and then let epsilon go to zero. So this is going to go to infinity, but it has a nice asymptotic expansion. Um, and this is the form of the asymptotic expansion. It depends on whether the dimension, remember K is the dimension of the submanifold and the boundary. So it depends on the form of the expansion depends on whether K is even or odd. So when K is odd, the leading term is like epsilon to the minus K um, with some coefficient. And then the important feature is that, that it actually shifts by two. In this expansion, you only have uh, power is going by two. And so if you start, if K is odd, then you're starting at an odd power, you go by two. So of course you end up with a minus one. If you're starting odd, you move by two, you get to minus one. And at that point, the parity is broken and there's a constant term, which I call capital A, and then terms that vanish. So that's the form of the expansion when K is odd. When K is even, it's similar, except now it again has a leading term epsilon to the minus k, but now k is even. So when you're shifting by two, you end up at minus two since you're coming in with even powers. And because of this, you end up with a log term that doesn't appear when k is odd. And then a constant term I call a, and then vanishing terms. k is the dimension of the submanifold of the boundary. So k plus one is the dimension of the minimal submanifold of the inside. So there's two numbers. k is the dimension of the submanifold of the boundary, n is the dimension of the boundary itself. All right. So those, that's going to be throughout the talk. There's a k and an n, which are these two dimensions. Okay. Yep. Keep keep asking questions. I mean, that's that's good. And do you want to fix this k in the last equation? 
the scale, the, well, the R, the, the, so the, the scale is fixed at the beginning by the choice of this metric on the boundary in the conformal community, that determines the R, which is. Um, my point is that you uh, uh, Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there is a scale involved. That's the R, but that's the way I, fi I, I fix R by choosing G. Yep. Okay. So let me summarize. It's actually getting just a summary of what we just did mostly because I want to rewrite those equations again. So we choose a metric in the conformal infinity that uniquely determines this geodesic defining function. And then we have these expansions. Right? Just, just, just summarize what we did on the previous slide. Now, now you want to think what happens when you change the scale? This is basically what you were getting at here. When you change the, the G, the metric on the boundary, that changes the scale, the R changes. And if you look at, look at the expansion, for example, when K is odd, all those coefficients, a little a zero, a two, all those numbers change when you change the scale. They all change. However, what's amazing, or I mean, it turns out to be understandable without too much difficulty, but the, the constant term is independent of the choice of scale. So that's this theorem. So suppose k is odd, then the constant term in this expansion is independent of the, of the scale that you chose uh, at infinity, which determines the r. It's a little surprising because, like I said, all these other terms, which are, you know, much higher in the expansion, uh, do change, but A doesn't. Okay, so the A is going to be is the renormalized area. This is what I refer to as the renormalized area. Um, so when K is odd, this is an absolute numerical invariant. I mean, this depends on nothing. You have one of these Poincaré-Einstein metrics with a minimal submanifold when K is odd, and it has this this number associated to it. Now, K is even, uh, it's not going to be important to me in this talk, but just to, to, so you know, then the, co the coefficient of the log term is, is independent of the scale, um, but A is not. So the renormalized area doesn't, L has a completely different character than A, um, and uh, L is, is usually thought of as the anomaly because it measures the way A changes, even if you just change the scale by a constant factor. Um, so in the rest of the talk, um, I'm only going to be interested in the case where k is odd. Uh, th th there's lots of things to do when k is even, but that's not what I'll be talking about today. If I ask you to draw those various shapes, so 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 the inside of this is my. Think of hyperbolic space. This is all very interesting. So think of this as actually the hyperbolic bar. And my y is some minimal submanifold. So x has dimension n plus one, y has dimension k plus one. That's some submanifold. It could be a surface or all the way up to a hypersurface. Sigma is the intersection of y with the boundary at infinity. That has dimension k. And what I'm doing is finding a renormalized area for y. The area of y is infinite because, because this is a hyperbolic metric. It blows up at the boundary. But I, what I've done is I found some number a that's a substitute for the area, the renormalized area for this y. Yep. And this is not going to be positive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Watch. What geometric information does it contain? It can be negative. Okay, so you, you, it's a substitute for the area, but it's not a geometric area, clearly, in, in any sense. Okay, so that's the main question. One of the questions we want to think about is what geometric information does it contain? Now, there's a physical interpretation um, that comes up in this ADS-CFT correspondence um, as an entanglement entropy, and this is the case of a hypersurface where where sigma is a hypersurface in M. So M, I didn't write that M, but M is the boundary. So if, if sigma is a hypersurface, then Y is a hypersurface. But the entanglement entropy, you think of a hypersurface uh, where sigma actually divides the boundary into two regions, an inside and an outside. And then in this, in this quantum theory, this, this conformal field theory at the boundary, there's some uh, non-local entanglement entropy between the inside and the outside. And uh, this, this entropy is some in, information theoretic measure of how these interact. 
And the, the prescription in ADS-CFT is that this entanglement entropy should be measured by the renormalized area of this Y, right? So I'm, uh, this is more, I'm more a geometer, but, but th there is a physical interpretation that comes from ADS-CFT correspondence. Okay, so that's renormalized area. Um, right. So the, the description I'm gonna give about the renormalized area, I'm gonna give a geometric description of it and that comes from a Gauss-Binet type of theorem. Um, so for a geometric understanding, let's first look at the case where K is equal to one. So that means I've got a curve in the boundary and I've got a, a minimal surface, an actual two dimensional surface inside some possibly higher dimensional Poincaré-Einstein space or uh, hyperbolic space. Okay, so in that case, let's just review. So the classical Gauss-Binet theorem is for a compact Riemannian manifold of dimension two. Um, and it, it expresses the Euler characteristic in terms of the integral of the Gaussian curvature over your compact manifold. Yes. Uh, so is the Y, uh, is it enough to say that it's minimal or could you have more than one minimal? Surface. There, there may be more than one. Yeah, there may be more than one. I think in the in the, in the entanglement entropy, I think they often try to take one that minimizes this, this area, but there certainly could be more than one. I mean, they're, they're definitely in general they're not. Used. And it's not that the it works for any one of them. Certainly, the renormalized area can be defined exactly like I did for any. Okay, that's right. I mean, you, you may get different numbers, and you may. You may have to think about which one do I want to pick if I want to interpret it in terms of something on the boundary, but in terms of the geometry on the inside, this works for any minimal symmetrical. Yeah. Okay, so the Gauss Binet theorem, this is a classical Gauss Binet theorem. What we would like to do is think about an analog of this um, for a Y. Like, we would like to think about a Gauss Binet theorem for a Y like this a minimal submanifold that goes out to infinity. So the problem is this integral is going to diverge. We would like to do this, but the Gauss curvature uh, uh, is asymptotically a constant on, on, on one of these Ys. And the area, as we said, is, is, is infinite. So that, that integral is just going to diverge. You know, the integrand is looking like a constant near infinity and the volume, the area is infinite. So it turns out there's a, 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 a substitute for this, um, which was derived by Alex Saka and Mateo in 2010. So suppose you have a, a two-dimensional, so a surface, two-dimensional minimal surface in a Poincaré-Einstein space, it's minimal. Then here's what the substitute Gauss-Binet theorem looks like. Whoa. Okay, so... There's two terms on the right-hand side, and I'll explain both of them. One of them is just the renormalized area. Uh, that's the A. And the first one is an integral over Y uh, of, of these expressions that involve the geometry, the submanifold geometry. So my, the notation I use is L is the second fundamental form, the extrinsic curvature of Y on the inside. And L0 is its trace-free part with respect to the induced metric. And W is T is the tangential component of the vial tensor. So Y is a surface. So what that means is you take an orthonormal basis at, at one point and you evaluate the component of the vial tensor on that orthonormal basis, right? So that's, that's just one component of the vial tensor in, on, this, on this surface. And so that's the integrand and in that. Now, like I said, you always have to worry about convergence of the integrals over these, these things because the area is infinite. But the whole point here that makes this formula very nice is the fact that the trace-free fundamental form and the tension and the vial tensor are conformally invariant. So in that integral, you can replace the metric because it's conformally invariant. I need my little, uh, maybe can I do it? Yeah. So in this integral, you can replace H plus by one of the compactified metrics. It was conformally equivalent. And, and, and with respect to the compactified metric, the area is finite and these geometry, geometric things just in, are in terms of finite geometry. So it's clear that integral converges by conformal invariance. So this is a very nice substitute for the Gauss-Binet theorem because we've got a convergent integral and we got the renormalized area. Okay, so the main thing I wanna discuss is a higher dimensional, the main result is a higher dimensional version of this formula. Um, so, there's one a preliminary result, or there's, somebody, there, there's an extension of the, the, the Alexakis-Mateo result was, was derived by a guy named Aaron Tyrell. 
looked at the four dimensional case. So you've got a Y is four dimensional and, 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 and he derived this in the hypersurface case. There's an analogous formula, uh, but in his formula, the integrand is not conformally invariant. And he, he, he showed that the integral in his, in his uh, formula uh, converged, but it was a subtle, uh, there's different terms that diverge at different rates and he had to figure out how to, how to make that converge. So there, there's a little bit of preliminary result this way. Right, so, so this is the main result that I wanna discuss more today. So it's a theorem modulo a conjecture, which I will explain. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a substitute gauss bonnet formula in higher dimensions. So suppose K is odd, right? gauss bonnet theorems only work in even dimensions, right? So there's this higher dimensional churn gauss bonnet formula, which this is um, a substitute for. So suppose K is odd, then there's a, a point-wise conformal submanifold invariant so this is the higher, I'll call U, this is a higher dimensional version of this integrand in the alexakis Matseo thing. It, it's some linear combination of contractions of covariant derivatives of second fundamental form and background curvature, like the vial and the, the trace-free uh, second fundamental form we had before. So there's a point-wise conformal invariant, submanifold invariant, so that if you have a Poincaré-Einstein metric and a minimal submanifold, then you get this Gauss-Binet formula, exactly the same form. The renormalized area comes in and you have an integral of some geometric quantity depending on the submanifold that's conformally invariant. And so the integral is gonna converge. And so that the integral converges by the same reason as before. Okay, so, so if you have a question, this is a good time because I'm basically going to discuss the rest of the talk is going to be discussing the derivation of this, of this. Only on the dimension. That's right. I mean, I could write it down in something factual. Yeah. I'll explain that. I'll get to that. There's a big conjecture. Yeah, that's not zero. How, how do you say it? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, and it's a manifold invariant. If it's invariant, in what sense? Uh, uh, it's conformal. So what it means is, so we look back at the case. So I can I can go back. If, in, in the previous case, it was uh, so k is equal to one. Then the u is uh, constant, the one half or whatever it was times L naught squared, the second trace free second middle form, and then sum. Uh, modular constants, the tangential component of the biases. I see this was the environment. Right? Exactly. And, and in higher dimensions, this is going to get more and more complicated, and it's going to involve derivatives of curvature, derivatives of second little form. But yeah. the point is, it's conformally invariant. You, it, it depends on the submanifold geometry, but if you rescale the background metric, it's combined. And that's what, that's what makes the cynical converge. Is it uh, invariant by itself or with this measure? Yeah, okay. So it, it, it scales by a factor that exactly connects the scaling of the area of the area. So the integral is an absolute number. Mm -hmm. Okay. A question here. Question? Um, is, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hi Robin. This is Piotr. Uh, so, you have a K and an N uh, in the theorem that's uh, that's on purpose. So there are two, or K is in N or, or what? Okay, K and N are both uh, arbitrary. So arbitrary. So minimal right. means minimal, which is, so if it's dimension 25, minimal means zero mean curvature vector. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So okay, thanks. Is, yep. Okay. 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 So, um, so this is joint work. Uh, I've actually have four collaborators: um, Jeffrey Case, Sumo Kuo, Aaron Tyrell, and Andrew Waldron. Um, so this we, we were uh, aim is the American Institute of Math. Uh, just say something about this. So this they have a diff they have a very different model for how workshops should work. Workshops you actually are, at aim you're actually supposed to work. On a, on a problem and, and, and they divide people into groups and everybody's supposed to work on a problem. So this was the problem that we worked on. So we actually, this was last August was when we, we uh, had this meeting and we started this. We've had Zoom sessions and so forth. So uh, Robin, another question? Yes. So 
So when, when you're looking at this minimal stub manifold, uh, the severe problems with regularity of the boundary. So, so you're assuming uh, smoothness at the boundary or something like that? Yes, that's right. So I said earlier on somewhere that I'm going to always work with submanifolds that are, I call it regular at infinity. Okay. Some polyhomogeneous expansion. Um, and there's a recent, actually, there's a recent preprint. Uh, this is Piotr Crucial, is that right? Yes, yeah, it is. I, yes. I, I, I thought I recognized, yeah, you said Piotr, but yeah, I want to make sure. So um, yeah. uh, there is a uh, recent preprint of a student of Rafe Maceo that establishes uh, this polyhomogeneity for arbitrary co-dimension um, of, of these minimal submanifolds of point gray Einstein spaces. Um, so that, that it, yeah, it under, wasn't clear I, to I, me that there aren't some. Say it again. Restrictive conditions there. Yeah. It well, wasn't a, clear to me that there aren't some restrictive. Yeah, there's an a priori assumption uh, of, of, of a low, low a priori regularity. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But in any case, yeah. So and as far as we're doing, yeah. I'm just going to assume you have the regularity, uh, the, the polyhomogeneity. And then there's sure. the question okay, of what do no you worries. need to get that. But, yeah, that's right. OK. Um, so there's two interpretations of this formula. Uh, one, two ways to look at it. One is I've been saying this is a substitute gauss bonnet theorem. So that's what that, that's one way to interpret this. This is a way to make the gauss bonnet theorem work. Um, I've got some echo here. OK, there we go. Uh, the second interpretation, though, is I wanted to motivate this by finding a geometric interpretation of renormalized area. And if you just solve this equation for the renormalized area by putting the integral on the left-hand side, then this gives you an, a geometric uh, understanding. The, the renormalized area has two contributions. One is the, the topological Euler characteristic, and one is the integral of this conformal invariant. So it, 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 it serves two purposes, um, and it gives us a geometric interpretation. OK, so question, yeah? Like for interpret this, this is there a disconnection between the CU and the usual integrand for the Gauss Bonnet? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, uh, I, I think the answer is there's not, there's not a direct relationship. Um, uh, in the case tables one that I already discussed, where, where this is the formula, you can you can see a relation by using a gauss bonnet equation. You can relate the, the, um, the uh, Gauss curvature to something involving this. I guess that actually what this one is drawing. But as the mixture goes up, this U is all more for derivatives of, of curvature and so forth. And it's, it's much less clear what the relationship is. I should say that there are other formulas this, uh, in the literature. Um, but and, and then some of them, for example, start with taking the usual term Gauss Bonnet formula and then, and then rewriting, collecting terms various ways. Uh, one of the issues with that, though, is, is, is that in those formulas, most almost none of the integrals converge. Mm -hmm. And you have to, have to renormalize every integral, in, or most of the integrals in the formula. That's one of the main advantages of this. Of making a conformal invariant here is that you get converted out. So every all these numbers are are themselves. Uh, I mean the A is the normal other things, but that's what we were trying to understand. Uh, yeah, so that's one of the, the, the motivations or the reasons that uh, this is a, 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 a good one. Okay, so I want to describe how this is derived. So as it turns out, there's a, a, a we, our derivation, in fact, the whole theorem is motivated by an analogous result in a, in, 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 in a sli in slightly simpler situation. So this is a result uh, involving renormalized volume that was derived by Alice Chang, Zhi Ching, and Paul Yang. Um, so their, their situation was just like this, except there's no submanifold. So you just think about the geometry of the Poincaré-Einstein space itself, no submanifold, and then the, the Poincaré-Einstein metric has, has infinite volume. And so you do a renormalization of the volume exactly the same way, just move in by R, look at an asymptotics, you pick out a volume. And so they derived a formula like this in that, in that case. And, and, and our proof is going to be, and our derivation is going to be modeled on that one. So I need to explain to you how the derivation works in the simpler case where we don't have a submanifold. We just have geometry of, of the Poincaré-Einstein metric itself. That's the Chang Ching Yang result. So let me let me formulate the result, and then there's three main ingredients in the proof, and 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 I'll talk about those. 
So our, our argument is, is similar, it's the same outline as the proof of this theorem of Chang, Ching, and Yang from 2006. So this is, there's no K, no submanifold. We just have the point prey Einstein metric. N is odd. Oh boy. Okay, so, so there's a pointwise conformal invariant of metrics now, not of submanifolds. So, so just, just uh, something involving a curvature and derivatives of curvature. So that if you have a Poincaré Einstein metric, then you get a similar formula for the Euler characteristic of the whole space, right? So we could have some topology in here or something like that. And it's the integral of a conformal invariant of a metric plus a multiple of the renormalized volume, which is just like the area, but you do the whole, the whole space. So for example, when, when n is equal to three, so we have a four dimensional Poincaré Einstein metric, this W is just norm of the vial tensor squared, right? It's the, it's the, the, the natural thing, that, that, that result was proved before this, that was proved by Michael Anderson several years before this result. That was the, the, the beginning of all these gauss binet type of, of formulas. So B is the renormalized volume. Right, so, yes, of, of the whole space. Yep, and it's defined just like A, like I said, but you just look at the volume of the whole space. Okay, so there are three ingredients and the proof, the Chang Ching, the Chang Ching Yang proof is very clever, and I want to explain it. And then we're going to basically try to make it work in the submanifold case. So there's three main ingredients. So the first one is what I'm going to call a, I'm going to explain these, the scattering compactification. So it's a particular compactification of a Poincaré Einstein metric. Um, and then there's the critical GJMS operator and Q curvature that comes in in the conformal geometry part of constructing this invariant. And then there's Alexakis decomposition of conformally invariant integrals. So those are the three ingredients. So I'll explain each one in, in order here. Okay, so let's start with a scattering compactification. So, so suppose that we have a, a Poincaré Einstein metric when n is odd, right? So n is, is the dimension of the boundary, right? So that's odd, even dimensional Poincaré Einstein space. So there's the, the scattering, uh, um, the, the function you use to make the scattering compactification, uh, Charlie Pfefferman and I derived in 2002. So here's what it says. So suppose you choose a scale at infinity. So you, you, you choose a representative for the conformal infinity. As I discussed before, there's a geodesic defining function uniquely defined in a neighborhood of, of infinity determined by G. Um, then the claim is that there's a unique solution to on the interior to the following. It, it's, it's like a boundary value problem. Um, so it's an inhomogeneous Laplace equation for the Poincaré Einstein metric itself. So the Laplacian of V should be this N is just minus N is just a normalization. So minus N, that's, that's the equation. And then the boundary condition is kind of like a radiation kind of boundary condition is that V behaves, has a logarithmic singularity, log of R, and the A and the B are more like higher order terms. They're both smooth. Um, so they're, they're much less, they're less singular than the leading log coefficient. And they're even, so the, the modulo uh, and even to infinite order. So their Taylor expansions in R are, are even. And the main point of that is that, remember n is odd. So the r to the n term here is, is an odd power. And since the expansion of A is even, then that means that there's no odd powers occurring in the expansion until you get up to r to the n. Right? r to the n is the first odd power because the expansion of A is even to infinite order. So this is like this is like the expansion for the the area or the volume where you have some parity that's broken at some order, and this is what happens with this with this v. And then there's one other condition that a satisfies that it vanishes at the boundary, and that's what ties the v to the metric g we chose to the scale. That that um, that that's that's part of the boundary condition. So there's this unique solution. Uh, it's derived by scattering theory. Uh, I don't. I, I don't have time to really go through the how we derive how we, we we solve this equation. But there's there's this this unique thing, and we we thought it was useful for some things, but we didn't. What Chang Ching and Yang did is realize that you can make a very nice compactification of your Poincaré Einstein metric using such a solution of this equation. 
So, oh yeah, there's one, one last important feature I forgot that, that is crucially important here that the, the B is, a, this, is this, this first log coefficient in this expansion, the first odd coefficient in this expansion. If you look at B on the boundary and you integrate that, you recover the renormalized volume of the whole space. So, I mean, this is, so you can think of this B at the bound, the boundary values of B is like a local density on the boundary that when you integrate it, it's a pointwise thing on the boundary, but when you integrate it only over the boundary, you recover the renormalized volume on the interior. So it's, it's, it's it, that, I mean, that's why we were interested in this. It's a very useful way of, of realizing the renormalized volume globally by solving, solving this equation. <laughs> Well, you, it, it, when you solve this equation, it, that's what gives you these, right? So, so B, there are... All right, so uh, you solve this equation and the leading asymptotic, you just, you just give the leading asymptotic log R and, and, and that's it. You solve the equation, you look at the asymptotic expansion of your solution and the first odd coefficient is whatever you get. I mean, it's, no. it's like a gear split for me. You see all the other that features. A and B pulls up, right? Yeah, but A and B have no logs. It's a smooth, smooth part of the expansion. The log is just the leading coefficient. It's like your radiation condition. And then there's all these higher order terms and you pick out the first odd one and that gives you a density to recover your renal line spot. Is it the fact that a vanishes at the boundary? Is it uh, a part of the boundary data? Or is it? it's, it, it's a part of the boundary data. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason is, remember, I showed this boundary, I broke the scale at the beginning. And this condition is what, just think if I do scale r by the formal factor. How is log r going to change? It's going to pick up a constant term. And, and this condition is what, what fixes the boundary condition to be determined by p. So if I choose a different scale and they have a different r, basically the, the a is going to get modified because I've changed the scale. But, but that, this is just the fixing scale according to g. So the process of solving this equation gives you b and b, right? That's exactly. Right. That's right. The boundary conditions of the log r and a is zero boundary. And, and then the, the solution turns out to be even up to this order, it has to be up to this sort of order. And that, and then the, 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 the B, if you solve for B using a boundary condition of log R and A is zero, you get B. And then, and then it turns out this B allows you to recover the renal plus. Okay, so, so, um, so this was this was there, but changing and Yang saw how to use this in a very very nice way. So here's what what one thing they do. Say so suppose you look at e to the v, right? V behaves logarithmically. If you exponentiate it, you're going to get a defining function, right? E to just exponentiate v, you get e to the log r. That gives you r, and then e to the a plus b to the n. That's just some smooth function that starts out looking like one. Right, so this is this is a defining function when you exponentiate something that blows up logarithmically, and because a vanishes at the boundary and it's even, the first term in the expansion of a is r squared. It's even and it vanishes, so there's no r term, and so that means that this this e to the v is a defining function which agrees with our geodesic defining function up to r cubed terms, but it's globally defined, uniquely globally defined. The geodesic defining function was only defined near the boundary. So, so it's a very good global defining function. So we use that to compactify the metric. Whenever you have a defining function, you can square it and you get some metric that's smooth up to the boundary. So this is a smooth metric. It's a, one of the compactifications of G plus, and we call that the scattering compactification. It was introduced by Cheng, Ching, and Yang. You It's a good compactification. Okay, I said there were three ingredients. That's the first so, one. Question, uh, uh, Robin, question. Yes. Robin, question. I, I can uh, hear so, you. So this is you, this function, right? It is unique. So conformally invariant, uh, yeah. Whatever well, representation is choose, it's going to be. It's unique. We, 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 we chose a, a representative for the conformal structure. At, we chose, we broke the scale. So th this is there is a one compactification for each choice of scale at infinity. It's not un it's unique once right. you choose. So, so in other words, 
Right, but if you change your your uh, compactification, then it's going to change. Yes, it's going to change That's in right. a controlled way, of course. But... Okay, uh, it will okay. change conformally. It will change conformally. That's true, but but yeah, but but it it there's a there mm -hmm. is you, there is a scattering compactification determined by a, a, a choice of representative for the every choice of representative you get a different scattering compactification. But okay, we're thanks. only going to need one of them. But but yeah, you 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 you, you there are, there is more than one. It, one, there's one associated to each choice of scale at infinity. Uh, is this theorem also true in Lorentz's Well, the problem is, I, 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 I have the problem. I mean, this is a elliptic equation problem. And, and, you know, so you, the, 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 this problem would have a completely different character if, if you're working in Lorentzian signature. I mean, maybe there's some analog, but I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah but, but, but certainly right off the bat, I mean, it requires a whole different analysis if you wanted to do that. So G hat is the same since D, but I don't know. No, no, G. So G G hat is a metric on the interior. It's, it's a compactification and a compactification of the point Cray Einstein metric. See, it, it's just you take the point Cray Einstein metric and you you know you multiply it by the, the correct defining function squared and you get G hat. So it's a smooth metric on the inside, which is compactification of the point Cray Einstein metric. Okay, so that was ingredient one. Set that aside, we'll get the other two ingredients and then we'll mix them together. So the next ingredient is more familiar if people, I mean, people who've worked in conformal geometry. Uh, so this is the critical, this is the usual critical GJMS operator and, and usual Q curvature in conformal geometry. Um, so let me just briefly run through this. So the, the, suppose we have a, uh, even dimensional conformal manifold. That's when the critical operator exists. Um, okay, so P D is the in the moment D is going to be n plus one, right? So, at the, but just now, just we do conformal geometry in dimension D, in some even dimension D. So there's a there's a critical operator. It's a it's a it's a power of the Laplacian. So it, it, ha, it ha, it's conformally covariant, which means when you rescale electric G, it transforms in a nice way. It's a self-adjoint operator, which starts with Laplace. It, it's, it's, it's a power of the Laplacian. The D, D is even, so it's the D over two power of the Laplacian plus lower order terms, and the lower order terms involve curvature. And co there's some universal formula for, for, for this operator involving curvature and derivatives of curvature. And it has no constant term. These are just some of the properties that this, this critical GJMS operator has. Now, Q is Branson's Q curvature. It's a, it's a, a thing that's been studied tremendously in conformal geometry. Um, it's a scalar quantity involving curvature. In dimension two, it's just the scalar curvature. Dimension goes up, it involves more derivatives. It's more complicated, but the, the important feature of it is that it has a very, very nice conformal transformation. It's not conformally invariant, but under a rescaling of your metric, it just changes by adding, it has a linear transformation law, and it just changes by adding in this power of the Laplacian applied to the log of the conformal factor, modulo this rescaling. So that's, that's why Q curvature is important. It has this, this nice transformation law. And a consequence of these properties that I've written down is that the Q curvature is, a, its integral is a conformal invariant over a compact manifold. That, that's easy to see, I won't run through it, it's very easy to see using these self-adjointness, fact that it has no constant term. Okay, now there's one important last feature property that these, that, of these, that these operators in the Q curvature that comes into the, the derivation. And that is that if your metric is Einstein, your background metric is Einstein, then these operators are completely explicit and they factor as a product. So suppose the, 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 we normalize the Einstein constant, lambda is just a normalized Einstein constant. Um, then the operator factors as a product of Laplacian plus constants. The, the, the Einstein term makes all the, the lower terms turn into constants and the constants just depend on the dimension, right? So there's, this operator factors as a product of second order operators and the Q curvature for an Einstein metric is a constant. 
Okay, so that's going to come in. Um, the third, so that's the second ingredient. So the third ingredient is Alexakis decomposition, which is uh, uh, you don't need to know anything about this. It's, I mean, it's other than the fact that it's a hard theorem and it's true, but it's easy to understand the statement. So again, suppose we're working in, in an even dimensional Riemannian geometry. Um, so the theorem is, suppose you have a scalar invariant of Riemannian D manifolds, of even dimensional of, of Riemannian manifolds of some even dimension. So scalar invariant, I just mean some formula involving derivatives of curvature tensor. It's a scalar thing constructed out of curvature and its derivative. And suppose it has the property that if you integrate it over any compact manifold, you get a conformal invariant. So I doesn't have to be pointwise invariant, but it's integralless. So Alexakis has a characterization of what all the possibilities are. Um, it can be written as a linear combination of three terms, each of which is the obvious thing that works. So the first one is just the Fafian of the metric, right? So that's the the, the, the integrand of the Gauss-Binet theorem. The integral of the Fafian is the Euler characteristic. That's topologically invariant. So certainly it's conformally invariant. So that's, that's something like this. Second possibility is you have something that's pointwise conformally invariant, like norm squared of the vial tensor or some higher order scalar conformal invariant. If you integrate a pointwise conformal invariant of the right weight so that the, the, um, the scaling factor works, you know, cancels out with the volume form, then, then you're gonna get an integral that's invariant. And the third possibility is a vector field. And you take the divergence of the integral of a divergence is zero. So any, any scalar thing you get by taking a divergence of a, of a one form or a vector field uh, that, that is given in terms of a formula. So Alexakis theorem said that that's the theorem is that any scalar thing whose integral is conformally invariant has to be a linear combination of these three types. So it's a very, I mean, it was a very difficult theorem. I mean, he wrote several pages of several papers in the 50, 100 pages, and then he finished with a 500 page book. So it's, it's, it's a complicated thing, but it's very, very intuitive. Okay, those are the three ingredients. So now let me show you how, how you put them together. This, this is very clever. This, it's, a, it's an arbitrary, it depends on, it, it, so, so, so it's a characterization. Suppose that you have some formula, a scalar thing you can start by writing down the program of curvature and contracting everything. Suppose that this thing has the property that it's integral is conforming or any compact manifold. Right, so then one way you could get such a thing is to take a vector out of the and take its divergence. If you do that for any any t any vector field, then when you integrate it, you overcome that method, you're going to get zero by purchase here. So, so it's it's just something that it's a way of constructing things like this. Other ways you can do it is look at something that's point wise and so. Anything that has this integration property, integral is conformally integrated, has to be a sum. You can say it as modular divergence. Yeah, modular divergence is it's, it, it's a it's a it's a family plus a point by three formula. Yeah, that's that's okay. It's all algebraic. It's all algebraic. Uh, Robin, yes. Is there a version for uh, odd dimensions now? Or? Uh, let's no, but no, because the, the, the scaling can't, the, 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 it doesn't work because the scalings, you, you, you can't, the volume form changes by a half integral power and you don't have scalar invariants that have this, this kind of a scaling. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I think it just doesn't make sense even. I mean, you can't, you, there are no, I, I just think there are no, uh, no such invariants. That's the point. Say it again. There are no such invariants, so that the integral yeah, would be. Yeah, yeah, I think there just aren't any, just because the, the scaling can't work right. I think that's right. Okay. Well, but, um, you, you don't have to, you can't write down a formula that scales the way that would cancel out the scaling of the volume form. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, you do. I, I, I haven't written down what the scaling path is E because that's kind of assumed, but um, yeah. There, there will be issues in formulating, I think. I think we, we can talk about it, but I think, I think that I really, I, I don't think it really is something that, that, it's, that you want to think about a lot of issues. Okay, so now we've got these three ingredients. So let me show you the Chang-Ching-Yang argument. 
like I said, it's very clever. So, so, so what do we remember? What are we proving? We're proving that that um, yeah, um, this formula, this gauss binet formula for the Euler. So the formula, the, the Cheng Xing Yang formula, is the one that says for the whole space, the Euler characteristic is the integral of some scalar conformal invariant plus the renormalized volume. So the theorem is really the existence of a scalar conformal invariant that makes this formula work. That's what that's what they're trying to prove. The existence of something like this. Okay, so here's what here's the way it goes. So we have a Poincaré Einstein metric of even dimension. So the n is odd. So what we do is we 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 look at let d be n plus one. I had this even dimension in what I was talking about, and we look at the the q curvature. At just as a as a, uh, a scalar object constructed out of a metric, and it, one of the properties I said the Q curvature has is that its integral over a compact manifold is conformally invariant. So the Q curvature by Alexakis theorem has a a decomposition. So we can write the Q curvature as a linear combination of these three terms. And so Q curvature is, is is particular things, particular invariant. Uh, not conformally invariant, but but point and so we write the Q curvature this way. That's that's quoting Alexakis. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to apply. This is a this is just a unit. This is just algebra. This is just a universal formula involving a, a metric, just arbitrary metric derivatives of the metric. It's just some formula involving curvatures and things. So we can apply this to any metric in in this dimension. We apply it to the scattering compactification of our Poincaré Einstein metric. So I understand that the assumption is that the integral over a compact manifold is uh, is more but the decomposition then works even on non-compact manifold. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about it's really just a theorem about you just write down some combination of derivatives of curvatures and and and, try, and and suppose you have such a just an algebraic formula, but it has the property if you take any metric on a compact manifold any, and you integrate it, what you get is the probability variant. And the theorem is that algebraic thing is to be written this way. So this is really it's just the, but it's just the universal formula involving just a, a, a just any you can apply this to any in any metric you want. I mean it's it's just a it's just algebra. Mm -hmm. All the it's, it's a it's a thing involving you know just the it's derivative of curvature. And variants. So you can apply this to any metric. So we apply it to a scattering compactification uh, of one of our points. Now we have to do that. What is, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Q curvature, the left hand side of this, and we're going to say what is the Q curvature of this scattering compactification. So I'm going to show you it's going to turn out to be identically zero. We're using the Q curvature to get this decomposition, but the Q curvature is just going to disappear. And this is this is a clever thing. So we want to calculate the Q curvature. Well, the 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 the, the metric, our compactification is a rescaling of our Poincaré Einstein metric. Right? We know how the Q curvature transforms under conformal change. That was the one of the properties I said. So what does the formula say? Well, it's the Q curvature for the background metric, which is G plus, plus the GJMS operator for the background metric applied to the log of the conformal factor, which is V. Right? So this is just the, the, the standard conformal transformation law for Q curvature under a conformal change. However, our background metric is Einstein. And we know, as I said, one of the properties of both P and, G and Q is we have very nice explicit formulas when we have an Einstein metric. So first of all, we know what the Q curvature is. I told you it's a constant involving the Einstein constant of the metric. So the, the normalization, it's, it's got Einstein constant, what I call lambdas minus one. So here's what the Q curvature is. You just look at the formula I said before, it's a constant. Okay, now what about the, the, the GJMS operator? Well. It's a product of Laplacians plus constants. And we're applying that to this function V that solves the equation Laplacian is equal to a particular constant. So when I apply the first, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right. 
So when I apply the first operator in the factorization to V, I'm going to get some constant because they get minus N plus whatever the C was. And now I've got a constant. When I apply the other ones, Laplacian of constant zero. So clearly you're just going to get some constant when you apply this, this product of Laplacians to something whose Laplacian is a constant. And if you go calculate the constants, you calculate this one, I wrote it down. You go calculate what this is using the formula I had before and these two terms exactly cancel. So this is very clever, I mean, to use this compactification this way. Okay, so that means that the, with, with we use this, the scattering compactification, the left-hand side in this formula, this left-hand side up here is equal to zero. These are both, these are, now, so that's my next line. So for the scattering compactification, this is zero. So we get, we get the hat just means for the scattering compactification. And now you integrate. We're using a compactified metric. There's no problem with integrating over the, the, the whole point gray Einstein space because we've got a compactified metric. Everything's converges, it's not, everything is smooth. So when you integrate, what happens? Well, the Fafian, you integrate with respect to the volume form of the compactified metric. Whoa. Okay, when you integrate, the Fafian just gives you the Euler characteristic. The integral of W is conformally invariant. So if I integrate this with respect to the, the, the volume form of the compactified metric, it, 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 I can switch back to the Poincaré-Einstein metric because this one is conformally invariant. And the divergence, okay, the divergence. So anyway, we're, we're trying to prove the Gauss-Binet theorem. This gives my this gives my only characteristic. This gives my integral of W for the G plus metric, the Poincaré-Einstein metric. Now, what about this last term? This we use the divergence theorem, but now we've got a boundary, and this is a compact metric, right? So I really have to, I get a boundary term, which using the divergence theorem, you get the normal component of this vector field integrated with respect on the boundary with respect to the, 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 the metric on the boundary. And now you have to go look at what this T is. So it turns out this T, Q curvature involves up like N derivatives of the metric, T involves maybe N minus. So it turns out that the T exactly picks out the BN term in the expansion of my solution V. You got to do some work, but right? remember the expansion, this exactly picks out that term. You, 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 <laughs> You actually get the integrand in, in the, in the, and when you get the divergence theorem, turns out all the other terms, the lower terms vanish by parity. Now, all, that's all this, even this parity stuff comes in. You just get B, when you integrate it, you get the renormalized value. So that's the theorem. The, the first term gives you the order characteristic. The second term gives you the integral of the W and that gives you your renormalized value. And does this prove give you an explicit form of that view? Uh, if you know, it, it, you have to know that right, so W is the, 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 you can tell me what it is. W is the conformal invariant that occurs in the decomposition of the future. So, in low dimensions, you can tackle the existing complex explicitly, but in general, you know what it is. I mean, it's not just from the existence theory, it, it is the W when you decompose the curvature. What the, but that's right now explicitly you can't do that in my general dimensions. Yeah. So what is the problem? What why do you say that the No, because because this is all this is all this is what we're having. This is what we model. We don't have any submetaphors. This is just the the result for the changing game when you do the renormalization of their theorem is a theorem. Okay, so 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 I, I, I so now I have to show what how do we do this for something else. Right, the white number about some So, so I'll, I'll give you the punchline. I'll get it to him. The punchline is we don't know the Alexakis theorem for submanifold geometry. That's going to be the the conjecture. So let let me let me I'm I'm you know running short on time, but let me let me quickly. Go. I think you see the pattern. Now we're going to now try to to modify this. We're going to have to do each step, each one of these three steps scattered in the submanifold case. So the the, the submanifold. I'll, I'll go quickly here. The submanifold scattering compactification is relatively straightforward. It basically works the same way. You work intrinsically on the submanifold. So instead of doing the scattering compactification on this, you throw the rest of the space away. You work only on the submanifold and induced metric, and you do the scattering theory on the submanifold to get the scattering compactification. So I'll, so, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll go quickly. So I think I'll just, 
it's our usual setting, right? Poincaré Einstein metric. We're back to our submanifolds now. We've got a submanifold. We look at the induced metric. And the theorem is that you can produce a, a scattering compactification. I call it the same letter, exactly the same way. The only di difference is that dimension is now the dimension of the boundary of the submanifold, not the boundary of the whole space. And you get, it, it just works the same way. Okay, so you can just believe me. You work on the submanifold and you can construct the scattering compactification the same way. And you recover the, since we're just working on the submanifold, the renormalized area is what shows up because that's the, the, the analog of the volume when you work intrinsically on the submanifold. So th that's, that, that basically just works the same. Uh, okay, so then you do the scattering compactification. So that work, you can do that. Now, the next thing is what about GJMS operators? So now we need an extrinsic version of GJMS operators associated to a submanifold. Um, so, yes, the scattering compactification lives only on the submanifold, right? We, we just basically just work on the submanifold directly. Now, the GJMS operators and Q curvature were standard things, but they're, uh, uh, there wasn't a theory of extrinsic. There's there's a little bit that's been done, and maybe I have some, some something on this slide. Basically, we had to derive new extrinsic GGFNS operators and Q curvatures for submanifolds to do this step of the process. So this is the topic of my talk on Monday. So so I I said here here's what I, I stated the theorem, um, but we can construct submanifolds. So the there's a paper on the archive now about the sub, just the, the GJMS operator construction. Um, the, the, we don't have a paper, the paper we're writing, we haven't finished the paper about the area gauss bonnet formula, which is the main subject today, uh, but this part is on the archive. That's gonna be my talk next week. So, um, so, I'll, 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 so we can construct GJMS operators depending on the extrinsic geometry, there they are. So they have the same kinds of properties and the, the, the there's a factorization that we have to have a factorization theorem to make this work as, as it was clear in, in that proof. So we do get a factorization theorem. And I'll, this is what I'm gonna talk about on Monday um, for, for these, these, this construction of these G, extrinsic GJMS operators. So there were, there's two other things you could think about for extrinsic GJMS operators in the literature. Um, neither of them works because they don't satisfy this factorization. That's why we had to construct some new, some new ones. So uh, I won't say there's, Gover and Waldron have a whole construction in the case of hypersurfaces using singular Yamabe metric, but this, this, uh, these, the operators they have do not satisfy the factorization. We had to derive some new ones. So we'll, you can hear about that on Monday. Okay, so, the, so this is my last slide. So the, the Alexakis decomposition is we don't know that. I mean, it's it's clearly going to be very difficult because the submanifold geometry is already much more complicated uh, than than the, uh, the the background geometry, which already was 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 heavy duty. Um, so this is our conjecture. It's it's just the the submanifold version of Alexakis decomposition. So suppose we fix L. Um, so this L is like k plus one. Remember, I I changed in plus one to D. So this is just a, uh, a general thing that we're going to, general thing involving algebra, just like we talked about here. So we have L is basically the dimension of the submanifold. D is the dimension of the background space. Suppose we have a scalar invariant of L dimensional submanifolds of D dimensional Riemannian manifolds. So it's sub Riemannian submanifold geometry. And suppose, same idea, if you have a compact submanifold, the integral is invariant. So the L now involves second fundamental form, not just background curvature, also background curvature, but also second fundamental form and derivatives. You have a similar hypothesis. If you have a compact submanifold, the integral is invariant under rescaling the background metric, then it's supposed to be a linear combination of the same kinds of three terms. The fact of the induced metric on the submanifold, a pointwise conformal submanifold invariant, like like in the like this one, this is a submanifold pointwise conformal submanifold invariant, and a natural vector field. Whoa, what happened? Did I do so? Nope. Okay, and then the light has to come back on. It's dark. We need to. 
Oh, no, it's light up there. Okay, good. Okay, and then there's a the divergence term. So modular divergences, you have the same kind. That's a conjecture. We have, that's clearly very difficult. But once you do that, uh, this isn't perfect. Oh, it's working there. Okay. okay. Then, then, then the rest of the proof goes through. We apply the conjecture, this conjecture, to the extrinsic Q curvature. I'm just summarizing for the scattering compactification. Integrate. It all works. So about this conjecture. So we prove this in the two lowest dimensional cases. The conjecture where L is two and four. The two is quite simple. The four is there's lots and lots of, of terms that you could possibly write down, but, but we've shown that it works. And like I said, the, the, in the, in the Gauss-Binet theorem, the invariant that shows up is the variant that, that, that you get when you take the Alexakis, conjectured Alexakis decomposition for Q curvature. And that's, we only need to conjecture for Q curvature, not in general, because that's all we apply it for. And we've, in dimensions, uh, when, when we have two and four, we can, we can write this invariant down explicitly in terms of the Q curvature. In the lowest dimensional case, we recover this. So we can actually get the, the, the alexakis Maceo decomposition by, by taking the two-dimensional extrinsic Q curvature and, and taking the conformal invariant that shows up. And in the four-dimensional case, we do get, I mentioned that this Tyrell had, 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 um, had a version of this for hypersurfaces that were four-dimensional. And so we have a, uh, he didn't have the conformal invariant. He had, like I said, he had this ad hoc thing. So now we get the conformally invariant version, the right way to, to, to do this. And, and when the submanifold is four-dimensional, it works in general co-dimension. So uh, basically, we did, you know, it's, it's done except for this conjecture, um, which uh, is a whole different, you know, can of worms. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your excellent talk. Now, uh, questions, other questions from, uh, maybe we start with the audience in uh, in our room, then we, then we will turn to the Zoom audience. Uh, okay, uh, much. Do you know if there is uh, some sort of holographic interpretation of this renormalized Gauss Bonnet law? Um, I, yeah, I, uh, I don't know what you do, what you have, you have some idea in mind. No. I mean, it's already, the thing is, I mean, I usually when I think about holographic things, I think of something defined, or say something defined maybe on the boundary that you want to interpret on the, uh, in the bulk in some holographic way, but all the quantities here are defined already in the bulk. So it's more like, can you yes. figure out what this means on the boundary? Is maybe, yes, what, yes, yes, yes. That would be that would have to be what you would be asking. Because at least one of these terms is the hangman entropy, so the, then probably all your characteristics is actually fixed by the boundary. So then the question will be whether you can identify uh, it's conformal environment with something. Yeah, yeah. So the renormalized area, like I said, is supposed to be entanglement entropy. Mm -hmm. So then the question is whether this conformal invariant has some, uh, some gives you some information on the boundary that way. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable thing to think about. I think. Um, I mean, I, I think, I think maybe like I, I, I don't know how to. But, but the way to think about that is you take the renormalized area and write it as the order characteristic minus mm -hmm. this, this conformal thing, and then try to see if that gives you, we know how the renormalized area is supposed to be interpreted on the boundary of entanglement entropy. So does this give me you any insight into calculating or uh, entanglement entropy? Mm -hmm. I, that would be the thing to think about, I think. Okay, other, other questions? Now, what about the Zoom audience? Yep. Well, I, I would have one. So when okay, you're uh, talking about uh, submanifold conformal invariant, then, yep. uh, well, there's obvious thing that you make a conformal change of the metric on the submanifold, but you can also uh, make a, con a conformal change of the ambient metric which changes the extensive curvature and things like yep. that. So so what, what, how exactly do you define your submanifold yep. conformal so, invariant? So, so, um, 
So you don't have to include the uh, intrinsic curvature tensor because, or, so I'll answer. The, the definition is you just look at something which is a linear combination of contractions of derivatives of the second fundamental form and derivatives of background curvature. You don't have to include intrinsic curvature because the gauss cadazzi equations allow you to write that and derivatives in terms of just second fundamental form and background curvature. So the definition of point-wise sub Point, I mean, independent of conformity, the definition of a scalar submanifold sub invariant is it's a linear combination of contractions, and the contractions involve contractions in the normal bundle and in the tangent, right? Because the second fundamental form is vector valued, so it takes values in the normal bundle. So when I say contractions, so what you, what you do is you take some, some covariant derivatives of the second fundamental form, some number of those, and then you take covariant derivatives so in, in so this is with respect to the inducement or the all right so the second fundamental form is a is a section of of the symmetric two tensors on the tangent mm -hmm. bundle sure. and through the normal bundle and so these covariant derivatives are the induced connections on the tangent bundle and the normal bundle but that's that's what this means and then this is covariant derivatives of the background curvature the, the curvature of g and this is the the the, the the connection in the background space is the usual background covariant derivatives of curvature. And you take some number of, of factors of each of these, and then you do contractions. And you perhaps the normal this vector as well? Sorry? And perhaps the normal vector as well? Uh, uh, you don't have to. Well, I mean, it's this higher co-dimension. So there's there's not just one normal. And this is general co-dimension. I see. So, all right. Uh, we, we, that's built into the normal bundle. I mean, these things are normal. I take values of the normal bundle. So, so. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, you, you basically okay. do a contraction in both the tangential and the normal indices with respect to the induced metrics okay. on those. Mm -hmm. And this, and this, this. I mean, it's, it's well-defined thing. And like, like I said, we proved this for four-dimensional submanifolds, and you have to write down all the possibilities here, and 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 so forth. Um, uh, but yeah, but it's completely well defined, and you you use you use the, the 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 tangential bundle and the normal bundle and do the contraction separately. You don't have to write down intrinsic curvature because, like I said, the intrinsic curvature can be expressed in terms of these and derivatives as well by gauss cadazzi equations. So th that that's the definition of these these pointwise submanifold invariants. And then a conformal a conformally invariant one, for example, means you rescale the background metric. Always you rescale the background because this needs the background, but even the second fundamental form, you need the background metric. So you, you don't, you have to do a rescaling of the background metric, and then you ask that this whole thing changes conformally when you do that. And, that's and, what, and that's another what, question yeah. is, there a, uh, is there a good theory now of existence of these minimal submanifolds? Well, um, so there's a lot of literature about it. So the, the, the existence. The, 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 there's a, the theorem of, of, of Michael Anderson in the 80s is a, a completely general existence theorem for hyperbolic space, not necessarily for Poincaré Einstein, uh, but when on hyperbolic space, if you have any sigma, any codimension, there exists a, a minimal submanifold. It, it may have singularities on the inside. In general, it's going to, you know, if the codimension is high, there might be, it's going to be a current with some kinds of singularities, but there always is an existence theorem there. Um, I don't, I, I think, I think that um, everyone believes that the same, I, I, I don't know if anybody's written it down, but I think everybody kind of knows or believes that the existence theorem also works for general point for Einstein metrics that the, the, the topology, you know, these, the arguments Anderson was using, I think uh, is supposed to work. I haven't seen anybody write it down, but uh, so I think there's a general existence theorem and there are, uh, there, there's a lot of literature. There's in, in certain special cases, especially when the background is hyperbolic space, but people have looked for solutions, minimal things with certain specified topology, like you do in classical minimal surface theory. And there's theorems along those lines. Um, again, mostly when the background is hyperbolic space, but there's a, there's a pretty, pretty good existence theory. There were some uh, very optimistic uh, uh, physics papers by Aaron Wall about existence. So, uh, by who? There, has anyone, Aaron Wall. Uh, so, Wall, W A L L. 
And they spell so it? They look Aaron, so A R O N. Well, and uh, I was wondering if anyone made uh, sense of what he was doing. I don't know. You, you know? I don't know. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Beautiful talk. Thanks. Thank